So for the past couple of weeks, I've been trying to find badgers. I know there's a badger set, a den in this forest. I'm not exactly sure where it is, but it's supposed to be in this area of the forest where it's a bit drier and a bit more hilly. So there are more sandy places with some elevation that badgers can use to dig and, and build a den. So I hope, uh, hopefully I can find it today or somewhere this week. Of course I have to be careful because it's now springtime. So they are likely to have cubs to have, to have young. And they're very, very delicate, very sensitive to disturbances. So I have to keep my distance. But if I find them, I hope to return with my photo blind and my telephoto lens and actually document their behavior. So of course, along your way, you encounter many interesting plants and animals. This one, for example, is pretty interesting. This is known as Heraclium montegasianum, colloquially known as the common hogweed or giant hogweed. And this is, is a huge plant which grows every summer. And this one is about three meters tall, so about 10 feet in length. And this giant hogweed is invasive everywhere in Europe, in the United States, in England, for example. And it covers entire areas very quickly. Uh, because of its big leaves, it can cover a lot of area quickly and it can outcompete native plants. Not only is it invasive in many areas, it's also phototoxic, meaning that if you touch the plant when it is green in the summer, uh, phototoxic compounds from the leaves and the stem and the flowers, they adhere to your skin. And in response to UV light, to sunlight, it becomes phototoxic. So these compounds do not directly irritate the skin. But after a few hours of exposure to the sun, you can get severe dermatitis. Which means that you get severe blisters and burns and even scars after touching this plant and spending time in the sun. So for many reasons, this plant needs to be um, kept under control. Now, of course, there are programs in place to eradicate this plant and also here in the forests. So in some areas they use grazers like sheep or cows or other cattle to get rid of the small plants. And they also mow the plants every spring when they're still small. Sometimes they mow the plants again during summer when there's a second wave of plant growth. And we also have volunteers actively scouring the forest for this, for this plant. And volunteers actually will destroy these plants to make sure that they do not cover the entire forest. But here in the, in the Netherlands, this is a big problem, this plant. And it, it is still, every year I can see it growing more and more and covering more places. So it is something to, uh, something to address. It's a very interesting plant with very interesting biology. It's a huge thick stem. It's amazing how fast this plant can grow every year. Uh, it's really a giant weed and we need to treat it as such. We should not have to exterminate it, but at least keep it under control. Thank you. 
this could indeed be an active set or badger den. Could also be a fox's. But judging by the, uh, the marks and the scent that has been dug away recently, I think this is an active den occupied by a fox or badger or some animal. So most of you will already know this, but what I usually do is I put a few branches in front of the, uh, in front of the den like this. And then I'm going to block this entrance a little bit, not too heavily, but just to see if an animal passes by. So these three twigs will tell me tomorrow or the day after if an animal has gone in, of, in or out of this, this den uh, recently. And then I know that this, this is an active inhabited uh, den. So I can perhaps place a wild camera, uh, uh, a camera trap to see what animal actually lives here. So this is one of those sites that could have a better set. There is elevation here, it's sandy. Years ago they uh, put these sandy hills here um, because they were um, making a canal. Uh, and this is the leftover sand that got overgrown by trees and shrubs. And this is ideal for, uh, for badgers. So with a freshly installed battery and some water, let me tell you something about this forest. I'm now sitting in one of the hideouts that are built all throughout the forest. Uh, and these wooden towers or hideouts, uh, they've been constructed by our forestry department so that they can spot game, you know, um, uh, deer, uh, fallow deer, for example, or roe deer. Um, from this um, slight elevation. But it can also be used by tourists uh, and people such as me, people who are just enthusiastic about nature. And early in the morning or in the evening, you can sit here and spot some deer and set up your telephoto lens, for example. It's pretty comfortable. And you're, all, you're also protected from, from, from rain, so that's nice. So, so this forest is quite young. It's known as Horsterwald Forest. It's uh, in Flevoland, a province in the center of the Netherlands. And it's a pretty young forest that was built uh, in the 1970s. That's when they st started planting most of these trees. And it was initially designed as a, as a production forest. Because in the 1950s, uh, this area was reclaimed from the sea. Uh, and later homes were built and, and this production forest was established. And then from the 1990s and onwards, um, this forest slowly became uh, a more rewilded forest. So less, less lumber was needed, more nature was needed. So this forest slowly was transitioned into uh, a preserve um, for wildlife, but also for recreational activities. But the forest still bears the telltale signs of wood production. If you fly over this forest, you can see all these neat squares, these neat patches of different species of tree, such as ash and beech. Um, and poplar but it's fine I mean the animals don't mind the fact that all these uh, trees are placed in neat rows we still have a lot of foxes uh, even a wolf uh, a wolf was seen here a few years ago and since 2016 supposedly we have badgers uh, and that's one of my goals during these weeks to find a badger set now that the forest is still uh, quite bare we don't have too many leaves so it's still quite easy to, to spot dens and holes and such. Of course, don't pay attention to all the shit that's here. Because you are sharing this shit with other animals. Um, so as Morten Hilmer usually says, I'm sure you guys know him. If you don't, uh, please check out his channel using the uh, link above me. Um, he usually says that you're a guest in nature. And I fully agree with him, we are a guest in nature. And that means we have to put up with uh, the shit in this little cabin, in this, uh, in this case. And that's fine.
Well, this surely is an interesting building that I stumbled across. I didn't know about this, I swear. Well, this was a small bunker that's no longer occupied, which was used by, uh, I think, the Ministry of, of Water, uh, Waterworks, um, during uh, an era of construction. It's no longer used, I think. The toilets are all gone, plumbing's all gone, but interesting nonetheless. Now look what I just found, a nice skull of a roe deer. We have thousands of roe deer in this forest, and they're actually being actively hunted. We also have a lot of foxes uh, which prey on these roe deer. And this is a, a beautiful specimen. Usually I don't find skulls this beautiful. It no longer has the lower jaw, but it still has the antlers. And um, well, the rest of the skull is pretty much intact. So this is a beautiful find. It's always nice to come across these. But I'll leave this uh, here for now. Well, let's be realistic. I don't think we're going to find a badger set today. So I'm sorry to disappoint you guys. But over the next couple of weeks, I will keep searching because I know I'm very close. I found a lot of dens that are not inhabited. So I'm very close and hopefully during the next couple of weeks or months, I can actually show you some, some beautiful footage uh, of badgers in this forest. Thank you.